Good evening. My name is Andy Koo. I'm a faculty member here at SciArc. Thank you all for coming to the lecture. Um, tonight, we're honored to have CJ Lim all the way from UK to share his work with us. Mr. Lim and his firm, Studio 8, is based in London. The practice was established in 1994. The projects of Studio 8 are widely published. CJ received numerous prizes in international competitions, and even better, a repeating prize winner in, in consecutive years. Among the list of prestigious credentials, what draws my attention the most is winning back-to-back Shinkanshiku Central Gas Class Central Glass competition. For some might consider Mr. Lim as having incredible luck, because if you've ever been a serious competitor practicing in the culture of Archie Comp, this would be a realm of impossibility. Comments like this suggest putting all the values of a competition based on winning and losing. And of course, sometimes it is about winning and losing. We all, and we all know that very well. But for me, these efforts and prizes also signal a tremendous tenacity and relentlessness in practicing architecture. I suspect winning and losing is not the only thing that Ms. Lim got out of a well-considered competition submittal, but it is also an important venue for him to develop ideas and generate projects. CJ Lim is also an accomplished academian as the first recipient of the Royal Institute of British Architects for Academic Contribution in Architectural Education in 1997. It also received the same award again in 1998 and 1999. In 2004, he was selected to represent the UK in the Venice Architecture Biennale. Now he's currently a director at the Bartlett University College London. CJ Lim's work was first introduced to me in 2001 by a prominent architect based in Los Angeles. A copy of CJ's publication was handed to me about his studio, and I borrowed it for weeks. Like others, I was instantaneously seduced by the intricate nature of highly engineered imageries with super wide angle lens renderings, long shadows, its deeply saturated colors, tricked out details, and full bleed fast graphics topped off with italicized sans serif typography. I quickly became absorbed into the eccentric narrative and amused by the curious pop culture references that appeared in CJ's project seemed both personal and familiar. The dynamic lines of CJ's designs disciplined the fold of a book spread, commanding it so that they dissolve the contrasting ecology, ecologies of mechanical and fluid. The spaces of exploded atmosphere construct possess you in a state of ambiguous feeling of occupying a terrain of a golf course and staring into a Zen garden in the same time. In no time, I was in CJ's world. And yes, architecture is about making of a world. Please welcome CJ Lim. Thank you very much for the wonderful introduction. I hope I can live up to the promise of it. Um, I just want to thank the committee um, for inviting me here tonight, because I think you guys are pretty brave. Um, this is my first lecture ever in the USA, so thank you very much. It's very special to me tonight. And I'd particularly like to thank Lionel and Wendy for organizing me throughout the last few months to get this lecture going. Okay, I think, I thought my computer was gonna die on me. Um, I guess you heard a little bit about me. Um, I like to think that I'm a practicing architect as well as an academic. 
Um, in England, if you practice, you consider that you can do it. If you're an academic, you can't do it. That's the problem of being uh, a practicing architect who also teach in the UK. And so occasionally, in my past time, I would get down to writing a couple of books. And I guess some of you might have seen it in your local bookstores here. Um, this one was, I guess, the first um, one that we really got into. It was based on the Seven Deadly Sins uh, in the film Seven. Uh, inspired by Alice's Adventure in Wonderland. The latest one, uh, based on the conversation between these two guys. The series Realms of Impossibilities, which I edited, as well as the Devices series. So what is it all about being English? Um, I think it's a very interesting and open-ended question, especially for uh, I consider myself a foreign architect working in the UK. Um, also, being English has many connotations now, especially in the social and cultural sense. I think most of you would recognize these images. Maybe you're too young to recognize them. I have a great passion for the Carry On movies and the Monty Python series. Anybody know these guys? Yeah? Okay. I really enjoy English humor. They're very special, and you cannot duplicate it anywhere. And I think it has a great influence what, on what I do most of the time. And there are sort of racy jokes and narratives through na illustration. The next few images here are images, illustrations by an artist called Heath Robinson. Anybody heard of Heath Robinson? Okay. Neil, you're the only person who've heard of Heath Robinson. Heath Robinson um, was an illustrator um, at the turn of the century, and he drew some amazing, amazing drawings. They're not just ha-ha funny cartoons. They were very inventive, incredibly clever. I would like you to indulge me and look into the details of it. He was, I think, he a great spatial, innovative designer. He, he loves his gadgets. Look at the, the way that he used the flower pots as props. This one is my favorite one here, where you see this is a section through an apartment. Uh, the, the floor with a mattress, sponge strapped to the shoes not to disturb the neighbor sleeping, and the earphones chandelier earphones when they can dance around this gramophone. I think that's pretty good. A deck chair on the beach um, so that when the tide comes in, you can roll back. Or a prosthesis to enable one to catch crab by the beach. I think there's something very English about it. And the English loved to invent gadgets, props, uh, daft things, which probably doesn't work 99% of the time. Uh, if you don't know Heath Robinson, you probably would know Wallace and Gromit. Have you seen Wallace and Gromit? Yeah? It's very similar. I think Wallace and Gromit were mostly inspired by Heath's uh, cartoons. And Heath is my hero. I mean, more than Le Corbusier ever could be. My God, somebody's going to shoot me now. We love inventions in the office. And this is a project we did uh, for a park in Dublin. It's, to, it's a long, thin stretch uh, between two communities. And instead of actually just planting trees and f bushes on, along the edge, what we did is that we invented these sort of contraptions um, that bridge the two sides of, of the river, of the canal, sorry. And these are inhabitable kind of bridges. That's the basic structure of it. The framework, which has green. If you have two of these frameworks, you can 
fold it together or open it up where you can have sort of a playground or a basketball deck and so forth. So this is a kind of contraption where you can actually expand, contract, fold up and then display along the length of the canal or you can actually close the whole lot up and concertina them all together at one end of the site. The contraption could also change characteristics over the different seasons. It would be sort of bushy and green, uh, green with flowers, and in winter, bear in mind, this is in Dublin, right? Dublin is the reverse of California. It rains four times a day. I heard that you only have rain here four times a year. So the thing is that this is grayness in its extreme. So especially in winter, there's no point having flowers outside. So what you do is that you have a big poster, print version of a big flower strapped over the structure. It's economical, it's easy to upkeep. It's Bob's your uncle. And at night, the, the site is then illuminated by these sort of UV lights. I think there's, being in an English office, we love to invent things. As we love to really look at how machines and devices would inform us of our spaces. Here was the proposal for the Paris landmark Olympic uh, site. Um, it was before the site which London or Paris would get the, 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 the 2012 Olympic bid. And Paris, we didn't win it, we got shortlisted. The, and London won the bid, Paris lost. So it's not so good all around. Uh, here, what we propose is to have a series of balloons floating over, a series of 30 balloons floating over the site. And the balloons will have a dialogue with these uh, devices on the ground that as soon as the, the shadow gets in contact with it, it will switch on and off to uh, show a series of imagery on the ground itself. It was based on uh, around the world in 80 days. That's the other thing. I love working with narratives, with stories. Um, I guess it's part of my passion for storytelling. I feel that storytelling is a very important part of architecture. Architecture to me is not just four walls and a roof, or you know it, that could be to do with construction, but architecture is much more poetic than just building four walls. So the storytelling part of it is absolutely crucial to the way we work in the office. And this one was based as I said, on the Jules Verne's novel. Um, it would have, like here, a series of sort of paper mache flotilla floating over it, bringing different delegates from different nations to the site. I'm not handling this device very well here. And these would be made of paper mache, but human scale uh, pieces. And this is a plan that shows the interaction between the, the, the balloon and its shadow interacting with the devices, the, the sort of imagery devices on the ground. We were very fortunate when we actually finished this project. Uh, we got shown at the Royal Academy and this project is now owned uh, by the Victoria and Albert Museum now. They bought it uh, only last year, so we are quite proud that we are part of the history of the Victoria and Albert Museum now. I think the first time we ever worked with narratives was in uh, the Sins series of projects. Um, it was, the first trigger came from after watching the film Seven. Have you seen the film? Yeah? It was a very dark, uh, film about what we are and that fascinated me a lot. I'm interested in architecture which has a darker side. I think architecture is always very jolly, very pure, very, you know, you have happy faces and you Photoshop happy people in the background and in the foreground. Um, to me, the darker side of 
what we are, where we live, and our context and society and culture is much more interesting. So what we did was that we took the seven deadly sins and turned it into the, a program, a series of programs for making spaces. I'm not going to go through all of them uh, tonight because it was very difficult for me to do this lecture because it's my first one in the, in the United States and I would like to show you all my projects but I'm not going to bore you for that long. So I'm just going to skim through a whole load of projects very quickly from now on and you know I'm going to just show one project in fairly detail later on. I mean, we have done about 95 projects since my office started. So in about 12 years, 10, 12 years, we did 95 projects. I'll show you the 95th project too tonight. Um, we English like inventing things. We also like to be miserable most of the time. I mean, you have lots of soaps here, you know, where you have beautiful people on the screen. We have something called EastEnders in Coronation Street, uh, where people are always miserable looking and they have miserable lives and they look fairly ugly without all the plastic surgery and so forth. Uh, here, we also love to listen to miseries of other people. Hello Magazine is one of the biggest sellers. Uh, and we, we secretly watch the Jerry Springer show when it's on in the UK, so we love it. This is a project I call the Jerry Springer Museum, where instead of moaning to your friend, uh, we turn all the telephone, public telephone booths into confession booths. And you would go in and mourn and complain about what a dreary life you have. And then your mourning and confession would then be broadcast on a piece of landscape. And this piece of landscape is embedded in the ground. And you would then lean, lie, <coughs> sit over it and listen to other people's misery. Um, Trust me, the English love listening to other people's misery. Uh, all the newspapers, the tabloid papers, live on it. So this is a piece of architecture that is not made by four walls and a roof. It's made by bodies, human bodies. The bodies demarcate the space. The architecture, the space changes over different seasons. It changes every day. So in, this, in one position, you can have a fat person lying there, not that he's fat. Uh, with a woolly jumper, which is dark gray in color or black. The next day or the next season, it could be, you know, a thin lady sitting there with a floral print over it. So the architecture changes. The architecture is alive, is organic in a way. And I'm interested in the way that points in space demarcate a territory. We are also paranoid about what we eat. We also have this thing called the BSC, which is mad cow's disease. You don't have that here, do you? Not yet. OK. That's why in the last few days I've been in America, we have been having steak for lunch and dinner, because we don't dare to eat beef back home. So it makes you go crazy. Not that I'm not crazy enough. Uh, we, so it was also based on that, that we had this project for gluttony here. Uh, it's based on the fact that we, you know, we don't treat our animals properly. We don't feed them with the proper um, food. And here is, a, I guess, like most projects, we don't take it that seriously. It's a spoof more than anything else. Here, the spoof is about building a temple for each cow, where the cow is lives in the penthouse, gets its massage, gets fresh grass grown on a conveyor belt. Uh, sort of convey up to them. Little be known to the cow that, um, and then the owner sitting there on a sofa having a dialogue and a conversation with the cow so that the cow would grow better and, and nicer and would be more tender and so forth. And little be known to the animal that one day the cow would be sacrificed down here on this long table just like in the Last Supper. <laughs> By the way, you can laugh. I, I, I would enjoy it more if you laugh at how silly the projects are. Um, I think the other thing is that I think it's much better. Food culture is much 
broad and wider now in major cities in England. Um, when I first arrived in England from Malaysia many years ago, um, I went up north to Yorkshire to a boarding school. It was like a scene out of the bleak house. Um, but, and the thing is that all they eat up there is meat and two veg. And so you get a meat and two vegetables on it. And pizzas was really, really sophisticated. It was something for the Saturday night out. And so this is another spoof about what we eat here, but not in the Sin series. It's part of the, the, the How Green is Garden, the Alice in Wonderland series now. Um, I went to China, and I came across these really quite strange insects, grasshoppers. They were selling them like, you know, kebabs or satays or whatever you call them here on skews where you can deep fry them or grill them and you eat them and I was told that it tastes like chicken. Has anybody eaten grasshoppers? No? Okay. I guess you guys in California is not as brave as, as I thought. Yeah? Good. Uh, so here, it was a project about this is a, a sort of, the, the restaurant has this facade of this menu board of different kinds of grasshoppers on it. And you can actually view it as you come along. But the key thing about it is that it has these devices here that floats around like glowing lanterns at night. And you can actually, when you get to the restaurant, you can actually then deploy these things out. And they would go out to harvest the grasshoppers for you. Um, grasshoppers are not very intelligent, so at night all they see is a light glow and they would flock towards it. And you can actually have the freshest grasshoppers you want. That's one way of doing it. So what you end up having is that you have this sort of cloud or this sort of swarm of floating uh, grasshopper catchers. The other thing is that you can actually enjoy the grasshopper in this location is to have your table brought to the exact location in the field by the, 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 the ox. It's this glass tatami. And the glass tatami has little speakers on them. As I said, grasshoppers are not very intelligent. They flock towards light. They also flock towards, you see, they also flock towards mating calls. Like all males, I think, they're not very intelligent. I think the female species are generally much more intelligent. Somebody's going to kill me too tonight. And, and the thing is that here, when you're on the table, it would broadcast female ma grasshopper mating sound. And all the silly male grasshoppers will flock on top of the table. And then from there, you can just pick the freshest grasshopper you want to eat it. And that's a way of keeping the pests, these pests down in population. So you can kill away the, 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 grass, the male grasshoppers so that they wouldn't reproduce so much. And in a way, it's a much more eco-friendly way of getting rid of pests. That's the table upright with the speakers on it. The other thing that they, we love in England is to have a little allotment, a little garden, however miserable the allotment is. Do you know allotments where you plant your little bits of vegetables and crops and so forth? Um, usually have it in front of your garden or you have a community one where everybody shares. That gave us the idea for this project in Ducible uh, just off Lake Michigan. So if this is Lake Michigan, this is a park here. And the park was, it was a kind of uh, proposal they wanted to do a park on the site, and the park was completely in, covered with chemicals over the last 25 years. So anything that's growing there, if a dog were to eat it, the dog would die over a very short period of time. So we propose to have a park that floats over this island, where you have a series of allotments which would not touch the ground, and then the allotments will be deployed into Lake Michigan during the daytime. So the park would reconfigure itself uh, into different forms uh, over the water. 
also each boat represented each boat allotment represented the um, the different communities that exist around that area. Uh, it became the kind of tapestry uh, that identified the multiculturalism around that site. I think one of our current preoccupations would definitely be about multiculturalism in our office. Uh, we have done a series of projects, some commissioned by government bodies, some we did it as a competition, uh, to look at how different race and communities could exist in one place. Um, here, this is London. This is Blackfriars Bridge, but without the bridge. Only the columns left. These are the columns that's left on there. And so we thought it would be an interesting context to put a beach in central London. London is not near any beach. The nearest beach would be probably Brighton or Blackpool. And here we put a deck over those columns and proposed an internal kind of city, inner city bridge, uh, beach, sorry. And it would all have all the trappings and cheesiness of uh, any beach uh, culture. I think the next couple projects also look at how we can restructure uh, sites and tra traditionally sort of single, cu single culture uh, places. This is Shaftesbury Avenue on um, Shaftesbury Avenue in London. And, excuse me one second. For those who doesn't know uh, Shaftesbury Avenue or been, never been to London, Shaftesbury Avenue has about half a dozen theatres. Um, and they predominantly uh, have plays on, Western plays on. And on this side, it's Chinatown. And it's kind of interesting, the cultural divide on the street. And this was a project that was commissioned by the Arts Council of, of England uh, to look at how we can restructure the street. So we propose to have a multicultural center strapped, hover, fall along the entire street itself. And within the street, they would have uh, a museum, it would have hotels, it would have many facilities that would actually look into how we can use it constructively to have a discourse about coexisting. Similarly here, we also recently did a competition that looked at how one piece of structure would tie together many disparate buildings. This was in uh, Hobart in Australia. Uh, another project that looked at how one could bring together different communities was, uh, this is again in Ireland, using a landscape. Using a landscape where all the architecture is embedded into it. And the only thing that pops out are the, the more key uh, buildings within it. It's kind of strange. We did a whole series of projects which is about binding communities together. This is one that looked at uh, in Hong Kong. It was a competition for an arts institute. Uh, that has separate a whole host of separate buildings, and they want to bring it together on one site. Um, the idea was very similar to this, where the sit this is a city, and this is where the ideas are kind of uh, being sort of discussed. Very similar to this painting here, where you always have the the brain, the philosopher on the hills hilltop, um, and the building looks something like that, where the administration block and the workshops and everything is inside here and the design studios hovers almost like this cloud uh, over the city. This is the 95th project. This is the, 
the latest project that we worked on. It was a project that um, was organized by the Sinjin government in China. Um, it's the second, China has, uh, has, has planned five eco cities. The first one is in Dongtan near Shanghai. And this is the second one. We were invited for the competition. We, we got to the last round. Unfortunately, uh, we didn't win it. We came third in the competition. Um, but it was, nevertheless, it was quite an incredible experience. It was a huge site. And for a very small office like ours, it was a very huge undertaking. Um, and just to give you an idea, this is a site. This is the Forbidden City. That's Central Park, New York. That's High Park. So it's about three times High Park. We have never actually done a project this size before. And it was really quite exciting. Um, the, for those who doesn't know Shenzhen, Shenzhen is South China. It's the industrial and the, probably the wealthiest part of China. Because that's where, if you look at your clothes or anything that has, says made in China, it's most likely that it has been made in Shenzhen. Um, and this is the last piece of green area they have. And what they want is, they want it, this, the government, the Chinese government want to make this their second eco city, just to pacify the United Nations, I guess. Um, because they keep building these sort of power stations every month um, and burning huge holes into the, the sky. Um, so our task was to create an eco city. But what was really interesting is that um, it's also about binding three communities together. I mean, when we talk about London, London is multicultural. Um, it has different race and from different parts of the world, from different colonies and so forth. Here, they are all Chinese uh, community, but they still divide themselves into the locals who were born and bred there, uh, those who came as economic migrants from other parts of China, and those who have what they call overseas Chinese, which is the third class citizens of that area. It's very bizarre. I, I just couldn't understand it, why they have this divide. So anyway, one of the, the, the key points of tying them together was it's, the site is for uh, is farming. They, this site here provides all the vegetables, all dairy products, all the milk, the eggs, and so forth for Hong Kong. So the key idea here was to keep it as a farming community. So we proposed an urban agricultural city where you have high rise as well as farming. You can have a white collar worker living next door to a blue collar worker whom, and, and so forth. So you have this multi mix of social and uh, economic groups. And the idea was to have a series of towers, very similar to the Towers of Babel. Um, to, and each tower represents a suburb. Because the site is so big, we have to subdivide it into various suburbs. Uh, and each suburb, you would have farming as well as living. Um, again, I'm not going to go through the whole project. Otherwise, I could just give a whole lecture on this project alone. We have so much materials on it. Um, these are some of the images of that project. The different suburbs, the canal that brings water in to cool the area, uh, the reservoirs on top of each where the water will be irrigated down the hills every day, uh, a cable car system for a car-free zone city. And lychee orchards to, as borders to filter the polluted industrial air that was blown across the site. So, from a very large scale project, we also do small projects as you could imagine. I guess this is what we enjoy most rather than these huge, huge projects, despite the fact that it was quite an experience for the entire office. Um, this is project we call the Suitcase House. It's again another satire. It's about the, the battle of the sexes between men and women. It's a house that 
everything inside it is female, in, from chickens to cows to the owner running it. And the visitors to the house would be men, where men would be spoiled completely, uh, everything would be brought to, to them, and um, in a way, you know, it just shows that men could be re redundant one day. I don't have any hatred for men, by the way. This is the last project and the main project I'll show you tonight. Um, it's called Virtually Venice. It was the project we did specially for the, uh, the Venice Architecture Biennale in 2004. We were so honored and happy to be invited to be, to be exhibited in the British Pavilion uh, that we thought, okay, shit, what should we do now? Um, it was organized by the British Council and, you know, it's like, I guess, who has been to the Venice Biennale in here? For those who have been, it is the biggest architectural show on earth. I mean, it is the most glamorous show. I guess it's almost like going to the Oscars or any of those to Cannes or, um, and so forth. And it's, so for us, it's exciting and it was also very intimidating. Um, and we were very certain that we want to do a very special project for the occasion, rather than bringing one out from the drawers that we have done earlier. Um, and I wanted to do a project which is a homage to Venice. Uh, I want it to be personal to me too. Not any project that we have, you know, we do as a run of mill competition or anything like that. So, I will tell you a little bit about it. But this is the British Pavilion. It's the most awful building in the Giardini. Uh, it's right up the avenue. You can see it a mile away. And it's a little monster in itself. Um, I think I didn't know much about it until we were invited to, to, to exhibit that. Um, what was really interesting, I told my mother about it, right? I was so excited. I said, Mom, I'm going to be exhibiting in the Venice Finale. She said, okay, fine. And then I said, you know, because I saw a photograph of, of, of this person visiting, I said, mom, Hitler visited the, 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 the building. And she said, oh, great, that must be fantastic. So, according to my mother, if Hitler ever been there, it must be great. So, but it's a god-awful building. And this is the inside of it, of our exhibit. Uh, the imagery I'll be showing you uh, would be these frame drawings or the models. Um, there are these huge drawings as well, which uh, they are like paintings on the wall. Each of them are about eight by four size. And the other side, we showed the Sins project. Okay. As I said, we wanted to show something special because the Biennale, you know, there are 29 pavilions in there in the Giardini bit. And then the Arsenale, they will show all the superstars. All my heroes will be exhibited there. And we say, oh God, you know, what should we do? And I said, we have to do something special. Something that, even if they hate the project, they will remember us for however much they hated the project. So I wanted it to be personal. I wanted it to reflect me as an Asian person working in the UK. I wanted to be to reflect that. I want it to be semi-autobiographical. And so I thought of this thing. It must be this conversation between East and West. And there was this conversation once upon a time between these two characters, these two guys here. One is Kublai Khan, the Mongolian emperor. And this is the Venetian explorer, Marco Polo. And in all the tales, uh, and including Calvino's book, it's always Marco Polo telling uh, Kublai Khan what Venice could be. And who has not read this book? If you haven't read this book, you must get a copy of it. It's wonderful. Uh, I don't get a commission from Calvino, but I think it's a wonderful, wonderful book. And inside there, because Marco Polo is a bullshitter, basically, and he didn't 
he has never been to that many cities. But to, in order for the emperor to spare his life, he would have to tell uh, Kublai Khan a story of one city each evening. And he would make it up. And he, what he did was he took little sections of Venice and retold it as a city in itself. And that was the amazing thing. So in my interpretation of the project, I want it to be told the other way around. What seen from an Eastern point of view, told back to the Venetians. This is Venice. Uh, Venice is a city of water, surrounded by water. There are not many, there are a few pavements. Uh, all the roads, you can imagine, if you've never been there, it's filled with, it's just canals everywhere. And the best way to see Venice is to walk. Uh, these are sort of touristic pictures, as you would call them, of gondolas. Uh, these are the main roads where, on the last one, you see sort of Venice having a traffic jam. The lion, which is the, the, the symbol of Venice, and pigeons in St. Marco Square. And at this point, I'm going to do my lecture in Mandarin. No. This is St. Marco Square. Remember, this is told from Kublai Khan's point of view. Kublai Khan, who has never been to, um, to Europe, to Venice before. So the imagery and everything that is within it, we wanted to embed it with Chinese, Asian, um, cultural iconography. And so the first one here, um, St. Marco Square, the square of life, energy, uh, where all the pigeons flock around this incredible square. It's about cultural differences and similarities, I guess, this project is about. And the first thing, again, going back to food, um, the square, as you can see in the drawing, is this shape here. And in our, it's a horizontal space. And in our interpretation, we flipped it up 90 degrees to make it into this, the Tower of Death. So from the square of life, it became the Tower of Death, a piece of structure which is cladded by hundreds and thousands of pigeon traps. Um, where these silly birds will flock into it and be captured, hung, cooked at the bottom, and then consume on these chandeliers. I do not have a hatred for animals, for those who love animals. Uh, it's just that I think they are quite interesting devices for me. Here, these are the pigeons flocking into the traps, and then the the meal served up on these sort of hanging chandeliers table. The structure itself. These were the studies that we started off with of the pigeon trap. And, and it's kind of interesting. It started off looking like this kind of mush toilet paper. More defined shapes, wires, by the way, I saw some I was Wendy was very kind to give me a guided tour in your studios, and I saw some amazing wire models from the first year students. Really well done, fantastic pieces. Uh, the, the structure that we wanted to jiggle and move, the cladding, eventually the model in situ in the, this sort of big version of a kind of pseudo-Victorian camera box. And the red identifying death on the tower. Again, the title is homage to the film Death in Venice. The view, if you're a goldfish from underwater looking up the tower, the ovens floating in the lagoon.
St. Michael, the cemetery. Um, in Venice, if you ever go to Venice, you must visit the cemetery. It's the most beautiful, tranquil space. In a month, if you go in September, uh, sort of July, September time, when it's sort of filled with tourists, uh, the, uh, the, the cemetery would be the most tranquil space there. Um, it's a place of rest. In our case, it's also a place of rest, but not to die. It's a place where you go and rest because you have been walking around Venice the whole day. Uh, because you know, that's the best way of exploring Venice. And these little pavilions are there for you to pamper your feet. Uh, they are made of, the scales of it are made of newspaper. I'll tell you a bit more about newspaper. But it was inspired by these sort of samurai warrior jackets. These were the studies. The pavilions themselves, the promenade, uh, the sound garden, and when I visited the uh, the site, I, when I went to Venice just for to do my research on the project before we started, um, I was told in guidebooks there are about thirty thousand cats in Venice. When we got there, I probably saw one cat and probably thirty thousand dogs. Uh, so anyway, that was part of the inspiration of this bit of the deck, where the deck, underneath the deck, they will have, you can't see it on this image here, but they're supposed to be little kittens, hidden, little cats, Cheshire cats, hidden, hidden underneath there. And when the pigeons flock down onto it, the cat would jump, do you see the cat here? Would jump and turn itself into uh, the lion of Venice. The sound garden, the section of it, one of these towers where you soak your feet in these sort of baths. The next bit is called Eight Gods Crossing the Ocean. Occasionally, not occasionally, on, on a daily basis, you get these huge buildings that move, that sail into the lagoon. This is St. Marco looking out onto the lagoon. The, 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 the Grand Canal is just out here. This is St. Marco, yeah? And then, a few times a day, you get these huge buildings, which are larger than the block itself, that then sail past your window. Um, and they sail very, very close to the buildings, the, the, these palazzos. And they are the scale of these windows. And what is kind of interesting is that when Venice generally is shut, all the windows are shut. And when these sort of cruise liner come into the lagoon, everybody opens up the window and stick their head out. And another sign of Venice coming alive, remember Venice is a town that comes alive for about five months a year, from about late May to late October, uh, thereabouts. And the rest of the time, Venice is like a ghost town. And another sign is laundry. When they hang this laundry out, you know that it's you know, waking up time for Venice. In our project, we also have this sort of enormous urban scale piece of architecture that sails into the lagoon with these anchors. And it's this sort of enormous washing machine that you can wash your laundry on. And it would have these tentacles eight tentacles, which has a garden that you can have for as long as your laundry is drying. And it will be attached to the windows. The Lido. The Lido is a beach, and that's where the film festival happens. Um, this was the inspiration behind it. Uh, it's like a flock of sort of foreigners coming onto the beach and making a new sort of tapestry on it. In our version of the beach, it's not sand, it's woven. It's woven like this. 
uh, it's woven out of lemongrass. We wanted something specifically Asian. So when you walk on the piece of architecture, you can smell it. You can smell it being of an Asian origin. Uh, remember, these are tales from Kublai Khan, so he wouldn't know anything else apart from Asian references. It was also referencing to these sort of the floating market in Bangkok, um, bringing food to the site, bringing foreign product produce. It's sort of the story came from my relatives and people, my friends coming from Asia visiting Europe. They always moan about not having Chinese food. It's not so easy to get Chinese food as you would get in California. Um, you know, I remember my aunt going there and saying, oh my God, you know, we have been having bread and potatoes. We want Chinese food. I mean, my aunt is not very adventurous, so. Um, and the idea was to bring sort of Asian food to the site. And the boats themselves are like grocery stores. They would anchor themselves on, would be the anchor points for these pieces of lemongrass uh, mats which are woven. They are the beach themselves. Part of this is also about newspaper. In Venice, you're lucky to get sort of yesterday's English newspaper. But generally for Asian newspaper is about sort of a week's old. And the idea of the structure came from this, where the pavilions are made from yesterday's newspaper. Uh, the drawing itself, we actually photocopied the newspaper till this, into this miniature size to make the drawing. And this is a model where you can look into it. Um, here we chose the Herald Tribune. Another thing about part of this is that the structure is these very tall structures uh, for viewing. I, this is again another spoof. We never take our architecture too seriously, I guess. Uh, most of my English friends, they think that if you're Asian, you can definitely fly like Zhang Yiyi in Crouching Tiger. I can assure you, I can't fly, neither could my Asian friends. So here we have structures where you can climb up to make a telephone call back to your relatives or friends, or whatever, back home. And when you're up there on the, you know, when you have yank yourself up to the top of the, the pole, you can actually get this terrific view of Venice because Venice is a very, very low city. A bit like Los Angeles, I guess. You know, very low structure. And when you're up on a high structure, you can see the whole city. The Giardini. As I mentioned earlier, the Giardini has 29 pavilions, empty vessels that are filled every year, other year by architectural works and every other year by artwork. It's a very um, strange existence of this pavilion. The best one is the, the Finnish, uh, the, no, the, the Scandinavian pavilion by Sverfen. Um, it's a wonderful building, um, the one that has a structure around a tree. Um, here we have also these structures. Um, and it's based around the six o'clock news. In every city, in every country, you have a six o'clock news or thereabouts. And here, what we want is that we want these structures to broadcast the six o'clock news continuously based on the time zone. And in a way, we have a lemon orchard that surrounds these structures, these floating vessels that broadcast the six o'clock news from different parts of the world. The architecture is not made so much of the hardware, but of the sounds and texture of different languages from around the world. And that's something that we were really interested in, in making space and defining territories through sound and languages. This is a kind of section of it, where you have the lemon floating, harvested lemon floating uh, in a pool, the empty vessels uh, that broadcast the six o'clock news. And on each structure, one is given a little tub of lemon juice and a brush where you can graffiti. Now, this is for once, you're allowed to graffiti the, the, the architecture. And the fence, which is made of paper, this, you can graffiti. So once a year on New Year's Eve, the fence will be set alight. 
and when heat comes in contact with the stained lemon juice, uh, the writing, the messages will be revealed for one split second. What we also have in the model is that this is closed and this is open. At every hour on the hour, this cuckoo clock will come out. That shows the lemon tree coming out. The four seasons. Um, the project is also a homage to Vivaldi, uh, who was a resident who was from Venice. And here, what we have created, instead of just puffs of clouds, we have clouds made of these sort of paper uh, cups that would float in the sky. And in Venice, because it floods, they have these sort of siren warning sounds. And here, instead of horrible siren warning sounds, we have the orchestra playing out Vivaldi's Four Season, defining the high tide and low tide. I guess the idea of paper came from when we were thinking what would be the most high-tech material in Kublai Khan's day, and we thought it would definitely be paper. And that was the, uh, how we started the, the, this whole paper cutting, manipulating type of drawings. And this is my team here, my office, working on it. This is Yumi here. Sort of this is how we do our drawings. We don't have drawing boards or computers. Uh, I think one of the things is that we were really kind of concerned about being swamped by my heroes at the Biennale because every, they have bigger computers, more powerful ones. In our office, it's just kind of quite slow ones that chug overnight to give you one image. Uh, so the things that we came up with this technique of representing the narratives within this project itself. And it's cutting very, very fine pieces um, and manipulating the, 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 the image. And this is the scale of it, uh, of how big each piece of image and the composition it could be. I remember um, somebody from the independent newspaper came to interview me during the process of making it. And he said that, you know, I don't have a team of draftsmen. I have a team of weavers. So they weave in my office. They don't draw. Um, the last bit here is um, the, we also wanted to produce these sort of what we call the grandmasters. Um, so these are the sketches that build up to a series of paintings that we did. Um, I think I might be running out of time, so I'm going to flick through it very quickly. And this is a poster. After the Biennale show, we were shown at FRAC uh, last year, uh, and they, they very kindly gave us an entire show there. And this is my team, my weavers, and my office. And one of the conditions when they worked on it, rather than the normal team, was that they must never have been to Venice. It doesn't matter if they can draw or cut a piece of paper, but because I wanted them to be Kublai Khan, because Kublai Khan never been to Venice. So in order to work on the project, they all have never been to Venice. Thank you very much. Have more lights, please. Thank you. Are they? Do we take questions? Or are, they... are there any questions? I, I don't think I'm British in that sense. I, and on, on one hand, I think I'm British. I think the definition of British is not white Caucasian these days. I think uh, for me, 
sometimes to be convenient, I like to be the outsider looking in, and it's wonderful because the things that one is much more observant, and you can see all the nuances that I guess inspired a lot of my work um, as an outsider. But sometimes I also like to think that Britain is a wonderful place today because of its multicultural community. So I like to think that I've, I'm British in the sense that I've contributed a tiny little, 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 little bit to the discourse of architecture. Yeah. And we, when I say we, I think maybe I meant a lot of times, I'm very, very proud of my office, my team, because the things that um, we are quite multicultural in a sense, we work together. I, I don't work in isolation. I think it would be more scary if I do work in isolation. And so we, as a team, in, we work together, and I like to think that you know, this work is very much theirs as much as mine. Any other questions? Yep. Thank you. Uh, what sort of role do you think uh, the sort of humorous narratives that you've created, uh, what, what role do you think that can have for architecture students and their kind of projects in school? I think humor could be very powerful and humor could be very enlightening at the same time. It depends how you exploit and use it. Um, I like to use it as a vehicle for my projects. But I also think that a lot of architects take themselves very seriously. Um, I really don't want to take myself or my office too seriously. Uh, we just want to have a good time. So the humor side of it is, I think, for us, you know, when we do a jolly project like Venice, we really have a good time on it. When we do a project like the one we did in China, we really slave over it. I mean, that we have to take very seriously because it was a very serious government project. We were paid a lot of money to do it. Um, and it was, we had great, very serious competitors. And so I don't think there was much humor in that project at all. Uh, there was a lot of blood and murderous midnight sessions. Uh, but I think projects like Venice, we knew it was not going to be built. It was just going to be a vanity showcase for the office and so forth. So we apply a lot of humor into it. But in general, we like humor in our projects because I think it could be a very interesting material. Um, and I think because we work a lot with narratives rather than form, um, I actually think that it's just something that we use conveniently and and that's it. Any other question? No? Good. Thank you very much, everybody. Good night. <laughs>